breakpoints, but a lot of its matchups, it's still very doable to get the OTKs with three spell damage. And he did actually win a show match versus J. Alexander, the two of them, the two supposed best Garot players in the world, and Fury Hunter asserted his dominance, winning over their, was it best of seven or best of 11? Something like that. But he is going to queue up the OTK Demon Hunter first. Only one card from the mini set featured in here with the need for greed. And I wonder how this is going to pan out versus Librem Paladin because I used to think OTK Demon Hunter should struggle against big tall minions with Divine Shield, but somehow the Paladin has felt slower and slower. But maybe this build from Jambre, which has cut the Varian from the top end to have a bit more consistency in the mid game May with the, the Blessings light. of Authority can get the job done. Peace. Yeah, that's right. Paladin has been one of those decks that for the longest time on paper has looked fantastic, but when it actually gets into things just hasn't really been able to... Uh, to get things done. But of course, Paladin is the deck that's gotten new tools recently. Demon Hunter, not quite so much. Need for Greed is a card that I feel like players put in their list as a one of almost always, very rarely a two of. And it obviously doesn't make the deck worse or they wouldn't put it in, but it's not really bolstering any win rates drastically, I don't feel. Uh, because even post Kurtris, it can only ever cost uh, three at its cheapest value, uh, which does make it a little less effective in terms of super efficient card draw than you may otherwise like. Uh, but still, as you say, the, pal uh, the Paladin often feels like it struggles to get those big minions that the Demon Hunter can, uh, can't answer online quite quickly enough. And uh, especially when you're facing a hand like this one for Fury Hunter, which, while no absolute standout game-winning hand right from the start, has got a couple tradables leading into a glide on turn four as well. It's doing stuff and it's moving towards his win condition with some pace. And for Jambre, the hand is starting to come together as well. He did have a couple slow turns at the beginning, which Fury Hunter could answer just with the hero power. But after this Bannerman has entered the mix, now there's a clean four or five curve for Jambre, except the glide has also come into play here, getting rid of the Aldor Truth Seeker and the Carriel, which Jambre was kind of relying on to get any significant pressure on board. But maybe if he can get a Blessing of Authority back from this, he doesn't. Um, he did end up with Carriel though, and the Righteous Defense, which was a one of in the original hand. So at least there's still some curve options, but I'm really looking for, yes, one of those big buff cards Whoa. to make this come together for Jambre. Now we're talking, this is where, uh, a lot of the different versions of Paladin feel like they meet at a point here with this Blessing of Authority because the aggressive decks are all running it. And now I'm seeing more and more of the Librem versions also putting in this Blessing of Authority because with the Parrot in there as well, it's just such a devastating combo to give it another plus eight, plus eight. Demon Hunter simply cannot kill that. And so as I see it for Fury Hunter here, with him having drawn a disastrous backup hand off the Glide, he needs to start drawing into some real powerhouse draw options off of this Tusk Piercer. That's right, he's going to overwrite the first one and then trade the Peddler to hopefully come up with a Spectral Slide or something like that, but it's not any further card draw, it is just a combo piece and it is technically a way to clear the 4-4, but not also the 1-1 one -one that I can see unless he wants to spend the Fell Scream as well, which is terrible. Uh, I think this is just going to end up being a swing pass for Fury Hunter. Swing face or kill Divine Shield? Demons. Probably get rid of the Divine Shield, but man, is it painful. It's starting to stack up. I mean, Jambre also, I thought he was going to go for a Carriel potentially. It would end up with still a Divine Shield minion on the board, but I think he was trying to make the stickiest board possible, which is to layer a Divine Shield under a Divine Shield, which is what Noble Mouth that turn accomplishes. Because say he had played Carriel and Fury Hunter had just gone for like Swing and a uh, buffed Fell Screen Blast or even a buffed Immolation Aura. The entire board is gone and Jambre doesn't get to Blessing on Curve. And the entire game game plan is about this blessing on curve. Yeah, this is the one thing that Fury really did not want to see. Everything else, if it was a wide board in any way, he could deal with it. But this tall minion, uh, doubling up on Arcanist, Moog, and Immolation Aura is not as effective as you might hope, as obviously the Moog dies after the first activation of the Immolation Aura, uh, and then does not deal uh, the full 12 damage that you would like it to do. Uh, only going up to 9 in the absolute best case. And so here for Fury Hunter, again, he's got a trade, he's got a hope for... Again, Spectral Sight, maybe a runner off of this Illidari studies, because his only game plan here is 
somehow spiking a monumental clear whilst also keeping momentum in terms of his quest. Yeah, there's just simply no easy way to answer this 12-12 ever since the silence card from Demon Hunter was moved into wild. Um, Moarg I beam can start to get there, but it's next turn, right? Araki has to tank the 12 this turn, plus what other other buff cards that Jambray has. In fact, there could just be lethal with double hand of a doll or something True. like that. Another happy guildy. And so we could have seen I guess holding on to the guild trader is just too expensive and you do need to get the draw. I'm trying to think about how he can juice up this I-beam to be anywhere close enough uh, to get the kill here. Like, if he gets exactly another Moag Artificer, you could go uh, Immo, Arcanist, Moag, Moag, I-beam. I don't even think you have enough mana at that point to be able to get there. Uh, but that's the kind of combo that we're going to need to kill off this absolutely bananas banana man. And I think because of that reason, the mana, that's why Fury Hunter didn't actually play the Sigil this turn. He's mm. hoping to top deck perhaps specifically Moarg, so he can play those and then play the zero cost Sigil to keep the I Beam in outcast position. Okay. Uh, but it needs to happen this turn. Um, math. I think a clear is possible here. It feels like it should be, doesn't it? But it probably completely wrecks the combo. So I'm looking at Immo. And then, like, Moarg, Talented Arcanist, Felscream. And then you can play the Sigil and still have mana to play the I-Beam for six. I think that works. It doesn't clear the, the horse at the bottom, but I guess you can swing out the Divine Shield. Yeah, all right, this does it perfectly. Ten. I was looking if you could do it from the left-hand side, which I think was still possible, but would obviously involve using the Fell Scream Blast to get the I-Beam cheap enough, whereas this just keeps it... Uh, uh, oh, well, is able to kill the horse as well. Just a nice optimization by Fury Hunter. Yeah, even better than what I spotted. Of course, you can expect that from the winner of the previous <laughs> Masters Tour. And, uh, yeah, just... So fast how he calculated that, honestly. Uh, but for John Bray here, he's got the parrot now. I don't think it gives... Does it give him Blessing of Authority? Here, was that the last friendly spell played? It does, right? I think that was the last one that was played a couple turns ago. True, yeah. It was It was after the Noble Mount, and it's friendly spells, right? So it doesn't actually um, take the Righteous Defense, because that was played on an enemy minion here. Yep. It's a big power, isn't it? And one that does not currently have an answer, even with a Moarg left on the board. Again, the problem is with Moarg and uh, Immolation Aura is you can play the other one, you can double up on these effects, but it, they just die after the first activation, which means here for Fury Hunter, it looks like he might be having to go for somehow sneaking a win next turn? I don't really know how, because if he doesn't, this parrot is just too big and it's going to kill him in two turns' time. Absolutely will. I think he's also used too many healing pieces at this point grow, that yeah, he can patient. like try to survive a turn and then go for Ilganoth. It's got to be some type of board-based game plan, but even then, I'm not sure how he survives the parrot. Uh, no taunts available for the Demon Hunter. Kirch is far too slow for Jambre here. It's just a formality. Even if he doesn't have any great plays this turn, just send the parrot face and he should know that too many combo pieces have been used already for Fury Hunter. Did there used to be a silence card that you could discover off the uh, the Illidari studies? There used to be, yeah. yeah. Outcast draw a card as well. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's that would be all great, the way right? in wild now. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Unfortunately, not available. Uh, and with there being no other silence cards available off of the uh, Illidari studies or just hard kill a minion, uh, this is one of the things that I think Jambray has really cleverly targeted about this meta. I think I was talking to you a little bit about it uh, during rehearsal the other day, is just lack of hard removal. And all of Jambray's decks, I think, really cleverly take advantage of this. Look at this big minion with the, uh, the Blessing of Authority. This is going to happen in most of his games with the Paladin, the way he's got it built. And the Demon Hunter, Warlock, Rogue, Warrior, can't deal with that. Same with the Priest, where you're buffing up huge minions. Same with the Druid, where you have all these huge buff effects. It's a very clever analysis of the metagame and realization of its weak points. And this is with Jambray essentially passing the last turn. He just buffed the pirate True. for plus one, plus one, had nothing else to play, and he's still just giga winning. You know, Fury Hunter, if this Arcanist were a guild trader, he'd actually have lethal this turn, but alas, the spell damage <laughs> is gone from that ability. So he's just digging for I don't know what. 
I yeah, truly either. think uh, Chaos Leech can that do anything here? Uh, Ivy, no okay. Yeah, no mana. Can that heal out of range? Nope. Mm, nope. Not at all. Jambray takes the win despite, you know, getting glided, losing the curve. It was just all in on making sure you could have a Blessing of Authority target. Then if by some miracle, it had to be a lot of a specific combination of cards for Jambray to even clear that first one. It does get removed. He had the backup Sunwing Squawker, and that one was just impossible for Fury Hunter to interact with. And I'm glad that you brought up the big minion text from Jambray because he's also kind of got counterplay for his own strategy built into his decks, right? He's got the righteous defense in the Paladin. That's something that can beat a Paladin that's trying to go for the same strategy if they're not running that card for themselves. And it's the, it's the trap that I fall into every single meta gear where uh, I shouldn't believe Jambraith lies. I shouldn't believe everything he's peddling on us with these decks because <laughs> when I lay it out, I can always convince myself that they make sense. And sometimes I actually have a lot of success on ladder, especially with the kind of druid decks that he produces. Uh, but again, the results just aren't really there for Jambray. I, I'm, I'm not trying to dump on him too hard because, as I said, I do think he is genuinely one of the best players and undeniably like top three deck builders I think we've, we've ever seen in Hearthstone. Mm. Uh, but the, the performances just haven't really been being put up with these decks, these very wacky deck lists that he's bringing. He's had a lot of 1 3, 2 3 runs at Masters Tours with uh, Bucharest a couple years ago now being the, uh, the last really impressive run he had uh, at 7 and 2. Uh, I remember remember it very well where I think he was vlogging most of the experience as well which was a lot a lot of fun uh, but yeah like I was saying it just hasn't been putting up those performances and so I, I wonder if this time maybe he's cracked it or maybe I'm just falling for the same old traps once again calling him a persistent peddler Derek I, I am indeed <laughs> whether or not Jambre brings these lineups truly believing they are the most powerful decks I respect him for just doing his own thing how True. many people can say that they've built their own decks and have had the confidence to bring them to a master's tour you know results we can talk about that another time but he's just having way more <laughs> fun than your average player I'd have to say if you're bringing these decks and there is something to be said for gaining an edge against players that don't really know what they're up against. I mean, he does it against me versus Ladder every single time. I don't know what I'm playing around. Uh, but perhaps Fury Hunter will have more knowledge than the average player because they are both in the Mr. Turney Ufen group together. Um, and Fury Hunter himself has also a bit of a spicy deck here. Mazaki Mage, we saw this in round one from Izzat, didn't quite come together. But I believe this is not just a meme deck. I think it's very powerful. And I think it might even be better than Quest Mage. I agree. I was playing this a little bit in uh, practice testing and I mean, if I'm winning a deck, then you know you have to pay attention to it because there's something <laughs> going on there. And I fully agree. I think that it's got the same kind of package of the early game for Quest Mage because, again, we, we, we talked about Quest Mage being a, a weak deck to aggro quite a lot with it being weak to uh, face hunter, kind of aggro druid but if we actually think about what the deck did what mage's early game does it's really good at clearing boards it's almost always going to be able to clear oh. off any board that the opponent goes for it's just the burn damage that they're weak to and this deck also has a very strong anti-early game uh, in terms of its uh, spell package uh, it's just the mid game where i think it pops off a little bit more quickly and that comes at the hands of mozaki which is kept in the starting hand by fury hunter Absolutely. I keep Mozaki almost every matchup, but especially Ooh. versus this priest. I mean, both these decks have something in common. They're running very few minions and a whole ton of spells. I'll tell you what, though, the spells for Jambray tend to make his minions very large, and that's his yes. win condition. But Mage can simply freeze those and laugh at it because they're just going to kill with Mazaki without ever having to attack. Um, it does, of course, involve Fury Hunter getting more card draw than this at some point. Uh, so Jambray is trying to double down on the fact that Fury Hunter maybe needs a little bit more time to get the full combo going. And it looks like he's even thinking about just dropping the wow. money right now. We will feed Not what I was expecting, I've got to be honest. In one of the few messages he sent to me where I was probing him about any tips to do with this uh, priest deck, he was saying, generally, you wait to go all in before you go in here. And even just coining out this Nazmani, 
is pretty all in. If this dies, his hand is doing absolutely nothing. But I guess making the read that with a double keep from Fury Hunter, it's incredibly unlikely that there will be the answer to be able to clear it off. Unfortunately for him, though, it's the, what is this, first flame, uh, first flame, second flame, with a hot streak of all cards in the middle to buy the perfect mana for the ping, which sets Jambre back so far. This was a huge gamble that did not pay off. Complete respect from Fury Hunter, and I think it is absolutely the right play because this particular version of Miracle Priest from Jamri, like you said, is not running Sethic and also not running Raise Dead because of that. There's no rally as well to try and get those key minions of Nazmani Bloodweaver um, to come back every single time. It's just relying on having them stick, maybe trying to prey on decks that don't get on board quite so early, but the removal was there for Fury Hunter. And now Jamri is back to the drawing board. There's the insight that can maybe pull him um, eventually like a palm reading but it's all just discover effects from here because the only win condition in terms of getting on board half of it's gone only one Nazmani left in the deck yeah holding off for a turn because he would never be able to play or he was never going to play the Nazmani next turn anyway I don't think because now he's waiting for that power word uh, fortitude to cost one or zero uh, but now that he's seen as you said no copy of uh, palm readings he's just going to play it and hope to make a really 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 big Nazmani bloodweaver and say this is going to win me the game ambitious but for Fury Hunter, there is not that much card draw. Um, gonna see what's in the studies first. Gets very expensive options. Um, is it ever Steward just to have some type of generation? What happens if you just go Mini Mage? I because I, I was going to say, if you play Mini Mage proactively, it gives you the ability to clear off one of their early game minions, I suppose. Oh, sorry, one of their big pushes with the Nazmani in the mid game. But I wonder if that's just uh, kind of naive thinking. And that if they play a Nazmani, it's going to have so much health that you're never going to be able to clear it off anyway. Uh, he does just go for it anyway, because I think it was probably the best option, given that he needs to hit some... He's hoping to hit some card draw in the next few turns anyway. So Stuart is a little slow. Yeah, um, it is a big deal now because he had that mana spent and out of the way and there's actually no Condemn or AoE in the list yeah. from Jambre, so the mini mage can just stick around for that additional damage. That's one way to revert the nerf on Quest Mage, I suppose. <laughs> um, but the big deal for Fury Hunter here is he's picked up the multicaster now. Um, he's only played Fire and Arcane, and so he took the turn to go Ice Barrier so he can get the full three draws from the caster next turn. Um, I think that is a wise move. You want to get maximum healing if possible. And Jambre is setting up for his own Nazmani, but that is second flow played for Fury Hunter. This is the perfect setup for Mozaki. Oh, cram session as well. You. I mean, are you even playing that? Actually, I was going to say you do, but you can just go with Mozaki and Cram yeah. Session in, like, next turn. It's very possibly lethal. But now for Jambre, with the Malagos picked up as well, double Nazmani that can come down. Like... I don't necessarily want to say it, but he can play a lot of his hand, and if the Malagos gets down cheap enough, possibly even a lot of his deck as well if he draws all of that. Indeed, but I don't even know if that's enough, right? Like one flurry and that's it. Fury Hunter Correct. doesn't have to care about that board. Um, he is just going to go for the palm reading first. And none of these are jumping out to me as game winning options. But power and infusion just kind of goes along with the strategy of make a huge Nazmani. It's just not much counterplay against the combo potential from Fury Hunter. So it's a question for Jambre is how long can he actually wait? He hasn't seen any mana biscuits. So so I would be in his position thinking maybe I have one more turn, but it's coming together, Derek. I think Fury Hunter has it next turn. And without Elusha or anything like that, I don't know if there's anything Jambre can do to stop it. Yeah, it was maybe possible on this turn for Fury Hunter, but I think there was a little bit of randomness you're leaving it up to, whereas next turn, like you said, even not being able to see the number of cards in deck, this is lethal 100% next turn, as long as Fury Hunter uh, does not mess anything up too poorly, uh, as we saw. Can happen in the previous series, but I have uh, a lot of uh, faith in Fury Hunter with these styles of decks that I think he showed uh, a great aptitude for in his win with uh, some incredible Garot Rogue play in Masters Tour Stormwind. And uh, so here you say, uh, Jambre 
probably just dead next turn. I'm trying to think if there's anything he can discover along the way to get him there. He doesn't have Mr. Smite in his deck, which is, I think, the only thing that could save him now to maybe buff it up to 30 attack and go for the kill that way. Uh, because, like you said, he needs a full turn to get ready with all these minions, and he does not have a turn. Oh, Smite would be sick in this deck, huh? You I should. Okay, sick. okay. Jamboree's going back in the lab after this. <laughs> <laughs> you know it already. But here it is the big pop off, discounting tons of cards. Actually, not as many as I thought originally, but mm. it's the train is still going. It's going to be a big Nuz money that Fury Hunter can very happily just freeze. Um, not that the freeze is relevant to preventing the damage so much as just buffing the Mazaki, but here we go. Each biscuit buffing for plus two spell damage, essentially, because of the two spells played. Um, there's also just the mini mage on board. I think each ignite can easily do 15 from this position. And as long as Fury Hunter doesn't play a random <laughs> cram session for too much to card draw and lose to fatigue, this is giga uber mega lethal. Sounds again like the name of the the practice group, the Giga Uber Orphan Group that <laughs> he's playing for. Uh, and like you say, yeah, I absolutely agree. This one, I think, is just absolutely in the bag. Rune Dorb alone is pretty much guaranteed damage with the minions attacking as well. Jambray just kind of hitting a counter. I like that he took a big risk. We saw right at the start of the game, coining out the, uh, the Nazmani Bloodweaver. Clearly a play you don't usually want to make with this deck, which only runs two minions you can buff in the early game in the entirety of the deck. Uh, but he took a risk, it didn't pay off, and maybe if it had gone a different way, uh, he would have been able to get there with the early game pressure with one really big Nazmani. Uh, so I respect his line, even if it did lose him the game here. Yeah, it did fizzle towards the end, but obviously you're not looking to run up into Mazaki Mage in the first place with this lineup. Uh, yes. I can see this Priest getting there against a lot more board-based matchups like Face Hunters, even Libram Paladin to a certain extent. If you just create one big thing and put Divine Shield on it, just like what Jambre did a while ago, there's not many decks that can deal with that super cleanly. Um, Garan Rogue also might struggle depending on the timing of it because there's no sap effect in that deck. So um, Jambre still has a lot of game with the Priest, maybe if Fury Hunter decides to run it back with the Demon Hunter, that could become a good matchup for Jambre. But I'm excited to see if he'll actually stick with it because Jambre's other deck is still very spicy. It's an Evolve Shaman, Derek. That's right, yeah. People have been messing around with Evolve Shaman for a little while with the... Uh seven mana six six that plays a weapon from your deck that i cannot remember the name of uh that kind of slotted in and out at the start now generally i think seen as being a little bit too slow in this meta game which uh i can understand even though it does have a fair amount of power uh but there's just a lot of different things happening in that deck at the same time there's the elemental package in the early game there's the the bolner part of the deck where you're trying to double up on the battle cries and then of course the extra spice that comes with tiny toys and bog spine knuckles it's uh, a lot less all in of an Evolve Shaman compared to some of the ones we've seen before, but is a, a, a typically Jambray deck, as Box by Knuckles is just one of those cards that is just eternally now a Jambray card. It truly is, and it creates all these variables that we can never really account for. Of course, the Tiny Toys minions are five drops and they evolve into six, so the power of Bog's Fine Knuckles is kind of dependent on the power of six drops in the current meta, which I cannot honestly give you an average for it at the moment. Um, if the mini set changed anything is also something I'm not completely aware of, but just the pure statage you get from that is a lot to beat a lot of decks, and that is the central theme of Jack Embrace lineups, right? Big minions that you cannot remove slap you in the face. You don't need fancy combos with spells if the minions can just get there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like we've been seeing, he's relying on the Gambit here, I think, that Obviously, his, his decks have a lot of power against aggro because you can just go for stronger board pushes. He's still paying an elemental package. The gambit he's taking is whether or not his decks are quick enough to beat, uh, beat uh, combo, sorry. The likes of Demon Hunter, the likes of uh, Mozaki or Spell Mage, and the likes of Garot Rogue. The Priest quite clearly was not quick enough to beat Mozaki Mage, as we expected, because they have the power of those freezes. So even if he had got a big minion, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to get there. Against Demon Hunter, though, I actually have a lot more faith in his Priest deck and his lineup as a whole, uh, because if he can just find himself one of those Sethic Veil Weavers and then wait until turn, I don't know, four or five, maybe six, before he plays a whole bunch of cards, he can get an 
awful lot of static online that Demon Hunter really can't answer. Right, the Nazmani is... Um, sorry, I confuse them as well. There's no Sathic in this list. Oh, sorry, list. sorry. <laughs> Nazmani's, um, yes, uh, my bad. Yeah, but I mean, that they, they are the beating heart of the deck, right? It's all about the discounts. Jambre's just saying there's no additional Priest cards I need to win the matchups that I've built the lineup for. It's just the stats. And so going by that line of thinking, then... Yeah, I guess you don't necessarily need Sethic. You just need the Nazmani to stick around, have an Alec mount, have a Power Word Fortitude, and hit your opponent in the face a couple times. Uh, that being said, I guess it means, a, I would say, look at Apotheosis, because that's another buff card, but he decides to deviate a bit and go for Devouring Plague instead. Um, I guess that helps deal with things like Tempo Morgs, if they ever happen. Yeah, I think it's more just to have a card that's more likely to be playable to corrupt the insight than the apotheosis is if uh, the apotheosis okay. if i had to guess because the way this hand is structured it is actually quite a big difference between a one mana and a three mana uh nasmani uh to yep. try and maybe cheat out one of these uh elec mounts at the same time uh but like you say it's a weird pick and it implies quite clearly i think or uh, shows quite well that they were not good selections off of the renew and as it stands, does Jambre have time to wait to co mm. corrupt the inside? Um, oh, okay. Today I learned you can play Devouring Plague with no targets. So, Me all right. Too. Make sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Well, the glide came at a very awkward timing for Fury Hunter. Can't mm. quite outcast it in the near future, given that it's going to be stuck in the middle next turn. Um, but he might just have the glide played for not outcast next turn to just um, c progress the quest that way. And if you are planning to glide next turn, that would imply pruning the hand this turn of cards you don't necessarily want to draw. Immolation Aura... I'm not sure how to evaluate it in the matchup because it could be one of the few ways you can deal with like a non-juiced Nazmani. Yeah. But then you have to ask yourself the question, if a Nazmani coming down, is coming down, isn't Jambre going to buff it immediately and thus the MO becomes not that great anyway? Ooh. I was going to say I think you keep it because with like Talented Arcanist plus Immolation Aura and then Moog plus I-Beam, that's like... 12 damage that you can deal to a minion on its own, which is obviously incredibly expensive, but you can be very liberal with your removal in this matchup. You just need to kill a couple of key targets, and you'll be able to happily sail through the mid-game. Uh, but Fury disagrees, focusing much more heavily on his own game plan by trying to get that glide in the outcast position. And uh, like I said, I wasn't expecting it, but I respect it in its own right. As Jambre oh. hits the one out of three, or misses the two out of three, depending on how you see it, and it's Malagos in his hand instead of the Nazmani. How are we feeling about that? That's a definite miss in my book, Jairo Kazan. It's just doing nothing until turn seven without a Nazmani. And that means Fury Hunter has all the time in the world to complete the quest. And the question is, how does he want to do it? Like, that Spectral being top deck here allows him the potential to deviate from Glide. Um, the studies can be played and he can still choose either option, but I guess it just ends up being Glide here. Although the Stalina, because he's expecting that to be a Nazmani in hand, he could be saying, let's put that back in the deck. Uh, in the end, though, it is just quest progression, which I respect. Yeah, Fury Hunter's got a very clear game plan here, right? It's, I'm going to kill you before you can kill me. It's the one turn earlier, because until you see the buff effect, you know you're safe. This uh, Priest deck is kind of a combo deck, but it's not a from-hand combo deck. And uh, quite clearly, Fury Hunter, although he definitely can't make the read that there's no Nazmani in hand, He's going to start to get suspicious, I think, because nothing happening next turn. And then, uh, obviously, oh. Malagos coming down on turn seven. You start to get a very good idea. And this for Fury Hunter, while I think it's probably got to be the Spectral Sight, man, that Stalina is so tempting. I mean... There's one in his deck already, so I do much prefer the Spectral as well. I, he can complete the quest um, in a lot of worlds even without discovering another Spectral site, but this now potentially allows him to save the original one for a post-Kirchus world and just get to the lethal sooner. So, um, 
also like Jambre just has more cards in hand now so it's even less likely that if there were a Nazmani that Fury Hunter would be able to put it back in the deck using Stalina but here she comes again creating one more crossroads for Fury Hunter uh, but turns it down once again it's all about the quest completion and I do respect the consistency of the lines yeah exactly he's very clearly setting up for like turn eight lethal I want to say like you play the Kirkus on six you draw a lot on seven and then you kill on turn eight is usually the game plan uh, with these sorts of quick hands that you get from okay. Demon Hunter a uh, a uh, uh, insight, sorry, being found for Jambray. It's fantastic to be able to get that other Nasmani, get these effects played. He still ideally wants to be able to copy it on the same turn, I would say. Uh, but he's actually just playing it down straight away and not even going for any kind of a big copy effect. Just the fact that the Powered Fortitude was one mana off was huge there, but in effect, it's still accomplishing something similar, which is making Fury Hunter hesitate, I suppose, for half a second about playing Kirchus, but he just doesn't care. He knows he's very unlikely to die from one minion, probably even mathematically impossible. I don't know if there's any way for that to get up to 30 attack this turn, uh, but we'll see what Jambray can do. Yeah, exactly. Without Naz, oh, sorry, without the Sethic Veil Weavers, like you say, it becomes very difficult to get enough juice uh, to be able to get there. The Sykes Split obviously helps with an awful lot of mana cheat, but I think you and I can both see it's not getting there. Like, this isn't the kind of hand that reaches that terminal velocity where Malagos will cost zero, he can draw the entire deck, and then everything in his deck costs zero. This is just about getting the raw stats on this minion as high as possible. Debating about the order of Psyche Split and Power Word Feast. I would say, you know, Jambray's in a bad enough spot that I'd like to go for the Psyche Split first and nail the discount on the Feast. I'm just trying to high roll like that from Jambray's position. But he is going for the more measured play of getting the Feast down first and uh, ends up with a threatening board, oh. to be fair. This could end up being lethal next turn, but Fury Hunter. Oh man. Doesn't have Fell Scream, so it's not quite a lethal of his own. Okay, those are a bad couple of draws because you can't replay them to get the uh, extra effects on the acrobatics. But man, this is really close to lethal, and it feels like essentially guaranteed on the following turn. So for Fury Hunter, it's just about taking any precautions you can that will hopefully mean that you don't die. And for the most part, just praying that Jambrake doesn't have some kind of a miracle hand that leaves you dead from 30. Well, Fury Hunter does have knowledge of the Malagos now, right? I mean, True, you can yeah. probably have a good read on that not being the second Nazmani, even though one Nazmani only has been naturally played, the other was copied. Uh, but you'd have to assume that if that were a Nazmani from the first insight, it would have joined the mix on the previous turn. So with that Malagos, is there any way he can die? Can Jambri generate 14 points of attack buff because he's representing 16 right now? I don't know, but um, clearly, like, if there's no option to kill the Nazmani, so you just have to believe it's not there and then go for your own lethal the next turn. So it's got to be a miracle, Derek. That's what the deck is named for. Here we go. Oh my goodness, he has to pop off like you've never seen anyone pop off before. Psych Split obviously can be really powerful for more reductions, but it's really expensive on this turn. Now he's getting three mana discount every spell he played. Janbre needs to go, 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 go. Uh, he's going, but maybe not five goes. It's like two goes here. <laughs> 19, okay? But then even if both Alex uh, could be played here, it is not enough and they are not cheap enough. I thought it had to be some type of Malagos turn, but he's clearly just hoping he's not dead on the other side. But Fury Hunter certainly has something to say about that. Ilganoth, Felscream, Moark, 18 in hand already. Just needs a bit more spell damage. Has plenty of mana to work with. That is not spell damage, though. <laughs> uh, and no hand space to go for... Uh, um, he can't also go for like the, the Ilganoth into glide play anymore, I don't think. So he's trading the need for greed, and that That's is the, the one. Oh, that was 
close there, Dara. That was unbelievably close. I cannot, uh, I cannot believe how finely that came down to. Like Jambray almost did it. I believe, I like, if I was him, I almost would have conceded on the previous turn. But I love that he stuck it out. So almost got there and handled it like an absolute champ. Again, the timing of his uh, Nazmani Bloodweaver was absolutely spot on to try and deny that Kurtris wasn't good enough and. Uh, the game plan from Jambro, what I was saying, the uh, the question mark in his lineup, can his decks go quick enough to beat combo? At the moment, that's looking a little bit questionable. Again, he's had some bad beats with his Nazmani dying on three versus the Mage was quite a specific hand that needed to happen. And again, uh, missing the Sethic in this game and instead drawing a pretty useless Malagos. It's unlucky. But that's kind of baked into the game plan. You're always going to be doing a one in three with these uh, insights in his deck. And uh, so far, the combo decks seem to just be running over him. So far, but there is one more that Jambre can hope to sweep with his last two decks, and that is the Quest Lock from Jury Hunter. Um, I've defaulted to just calling it Quest Warlock because it's not quite the same Delete Warlock we were seeing like originally from Give Please and APAC Grandmasters, right. right? Which had the double Altar of Fire and the Soul Rens and tried to win off of the Tamsin as a win condition while having so much deck deletion. This is still a Tamsin Quest Reward win condition deck, but but you're not running that much of self deck destruction. You're just running tons of card draw and tons of anti aggro tools. So much healing in this deck. It's insane. You can go from 3 HP all the way back up to 30 if you have the right tools. And you have the double hand of Gul'dan in this version as well, which can be paired with Tamsin Roam to copy and get you even further through fatigue after you've played the quest reward Tamsin and oh, yeah. kill your opponent that way. Um, this is a deck, though, that I feel could potentially struggle with tall minions as well. There is Moarg in there with the unstable Shadow Blast, but it's only one copy, right? And a lot of the other removal is better built to deal with small and wide boards. That's right, yeah. The, the Grimmery of Sacrifice is a card that can deal with aggro matchups very effectively, but the, uh, the slower matchups not quite so well as even just a, I don't know, an 8, 10 health Nazmani Bloodweaver. It's a pretty specific hand that you need, and it usually re uh, revolves around Tamsin if you're going to be able to clean that up. So excited to see how Jambray approaches this one. Again, looking for any of those card draw effects, any of those buff effects. A palm reading certainly does not hurt with the uh, Nazmani already in hand. This could be a little bit more of a, uh, a demonstration of the deck's power. Yes, it is indeed. The Rune Mithril Rod kept this early. I also really like. Not every list is running this because it is quite greedy sometimes if you're running up into aggressive decks, but versus this Priest, my goodness, will you take those discounts happily? Oh, yeah. It's doing what Nazmani's doing for four mana and um, perhaps even doing that twice given the two procs you can get from it. Um, the hand is coming together. I would say so so for Fury Hunter. You don't really want to see those bristlebacks this early on, but they could come in clutch to deal with the Nazmani once they go down to two mana with the Rune Mithril Rod. However, for Jambre, there is the juice. He can copy the Nazmani on turn six. And so many one-cost spells, the train could really get rolling quickly here. I mean, Jambre is nothing if not a showman. He's teasing us so perfectly here. We're seeing all the pieces of the puzzle coming together one by one. Even teasing us with the palm readings. Again, could have played it on three, could have played it on four. He's even debating if it's worth playing it here. He kind of wants to wait a full extra turn before he goes with the pop-off because unless he's going with the pop-off on turn six, he can just play the palm reading on turn six and likely discount an extra card next turn as well and then go for the pop-off on turn seven. It's all just about when he thinks is uh, too late. It's a big game of chicken where he wants to have the most powerful pop-off uh, available, but he doesn't want to do it that one turn too late when Fury Hunter starts to hit that critical mass. I have to tell you, I couldn't identify it for myself. I wanted to go in with the Nazmanis on turn six, but that's sure. just with the gift of Luminance, and it probably doesn't include the Psyche Split unless you are a god with the discounts, right? And it would have involved playing the Palm Reading one turn sooner, so I'm going to trust Jambre on this one. Not many other people had the bravery to bring a deck like this, so he's got to pilot it to utmost efficiency, and we are soon approaching that critical mass you talked about, because Fury Hunter is turboing through 
through the deck, has gotten two discounts from the ruined Mithril Rod, and he's got this Nightshade Matron to keep cycling through the deck as well. Oh, he's starting to do stuff. Things are happening now for Fury Answer. And Jambre saying, okay, this is enough. Now it's time to actually start making some power plays. And here again, I think we see one of the unsung heroes of the deck coming into play, the Draconic Studies. Because obviously when you're playing Combo Priest with the Sethix and the Nazmanis, if you don't hit the Sethix, you run out of stuff to discount. You just have a, uh, you know, you spend two or three mana on turn eight or nine because your hand just costs zero every turn. These Draconic studies give you something to sink that mana into and convert it into monstrous amounts of tempo. Uh, because again, if we can see any of the big board control dragons, like Blackwing could potentially come down, Alex Straza could potentially come down, and if not, even just the more mid-game ones like the Circus Amalgam or the Hothead can provide Jambre a huge board swing. Over on Fury Hunter's side, though, I love that he's going for the big Shadow Blast on the Thalnos for two reasons. Oh, yeah. Like, he's not really got any good ways of damaging himself outside of the Shadow Blast, because you're just trying to do this as quickly as possible and race jump, Bray. Right? And the second is, Thalnos in the race that pool is pretty good, too. Anything that can keep drawing him more cards, even if it's a bit slow, at least it's not an armor vendor here. And um, he can curate it such that it's... Uh, tour guide and Thalnos right now in the race that pool, I believe, both of which can help his ultimate game plan of getting to Blightborn Tamsin ASAP. But here we go! This is a miracle turn! <laughs> Here it is. He's going in. I guess you just make the most amount of Nazmanis as soon as you can. Like, you kind of want to buff and then go for the psych split. But as I said, with these Draconic Studies, I think it's just about getting the most mana cheated out as you humanly can on these turns. Indeed, the Power Word Feast is free. Everything is free, Derek. That's a race dead as well. Okay, sorry. Um... He ended up taking Desperate Prayer. I guess because, like, you don't yeah. even expect your Nazmanis to die. Ysera! Yeah. Can he play Ysera this turn? Okay, it looks like he's playing the Plague Proto Drake instead. That's pretty good. Again, this deck from Fury Hunter, no soul rend. Oh my goodness, look at this. How does Fury <laughs> even scratch any of this board? Uh, I... Quickly. Guess you're taking Holy Smite there just because it's cheap and allows you to play more dragons. Like, Elec Mount yeah. is nice, but I just want to cheat out more mana. Absolutely. Get rid of the All armor right, we vendor. Gotta go, go, go. Wait, the Skeletal's playable oh. as well. All of these discounts. Every just... spell he plays. Minus three mana to a card in his hand, and I think like the Nazmani doesn't target spells that already cost zero. Like they patched that some time ago, and that means that the Ysera joins the party as well. I was thinking maybe the Bristlebacks could help Fury Hunter survive, but <laughs> I don't think so anymore, Dark. <laughs> Imagine the Bristlebacks making a difference. Uh, There's more, more grimoire though, which is. Eight damage AOE? That's true. That's very true. There's the Divine Shields, which are kind of problematic, but he has these 1-1s one -one sticking around to ping off some shields. Actually, it's kind of doable. With the Thalnos as well, that's like infinite board clear, right? That gets up to like 16. He's just true. doing it. Grimoire of Sacrifice, destroy a minion deal, two damage to all enemy minions. And of course, that does stack with Moarg and with the spell damage. It's even better than what Demon Hunter does. This is literally infinity board clear potential with the Tams <laughs> in as well. I can't even believe how much this is. Uh, yeah, I guess he's going... Tams in Grimoire, Tamsin Grimoire? That double works. Grimoire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um... Okay, goes for the Thalnos instead, which does allow him the breakpoint to deal with the Ysera and the Proto Drake as well, which is a big deal, right? Right? Giant Mortal Coil, not quite enough to get rid of the Kargath, but it's done its job, right? That's the push from Jambre. Thankfully for Jambre, he actually generated Ysera as a dragon, so he has more stuff to do. But most other dragons, like his hand would just be empty right now. Um, yeah. So is this Insta Awakens just and then play an Emerald Drake? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you ever go for Silence instead, but I think that like tempo quote unquote you're getting from keeping a 5-5 five five doesn't feel worth it. So I agree. Awakens does feel good. 
Right, and then he just ends up developing an Emerald Drake, which then gets shot by the Blood Shard Bristlebuck. So as I look at it again, Derek, after all our hype at that amazing turn from Jean Bray, <laughs> this deck actually has the capability of dealing 12 AoE and then some crazy what the Moorgs can do with this Grimoire. <laughs> And I've been sleeping on this deck big time. I mean, I've been sleeping on Jambro's deck because I kind of forgot it existed before he submitted it to the Master's Tour. Uh, but this Grimoire Demon Hunter looking super, super strong. And so in the end, yep, Ysera awakens the Emerald Drake. It's the expected game plan for Jambro. But now, as we, we see a little shake of the head and his lustrous mane flowing in the breeze <laughs> alongside it, I think he knows as well as we do. This is looking absolutely miserable. Yep, Tamsin already available for Fury Hunter this turn. Can be played with a Bristleback, can be played with Backfire, whatever Fury Hunter likes. I mean, is there any downside to just removing the 7 6 and then going for the lethal next turn? I guess he knows he's never dead either way. So he knows that four of the cards in hand are... Well, he knows what three of them are exactly. One of them is a dragon, which could be like Alex Straza, but that obviously never gives lethal anyway. And then two With cards Nightmare? off the top. Oh, it's good point. Off, right? Yeah. With Nightmare would be one off. Actually, that wow. it was... I mean, if he had that calculated and it's one off anyway, then all, more power to Fury Hunter, right? Because <laughs> Fury Hunter's just setting up his own lethal, right? With the Tams in yeah. hand hand, which is going to be like... Fatigue two through seven, plus the natural fatigue of drawing the cart. Yep. Uh, and I think that is guaranteed lethal, so. Man. <laughs> Dombre doing the best he can to try and threaten a two turn lethal setup, but I think we can do the math right. Um, Fury Hunter will deal one through seven arithmetic sequence fatigue, which is uh, 15. 28 damage? Yeah. Is it actually one off? He can also then just coil at the Four end of guide. that. Yeah, yeah with four guide as well. Perhaps. So yeah, it is just so it's infinite enough. damage. <laughs> and there it is. Our previous winner, Fury Hunter, once again defeating the on-stream curse. He's cast it well and truly aside as he goes up 2-0 and zero at the start of this Masters Tour. A bittersweet victory, I'm sure, because it does, of course, mean that it's a 1-1 one, one start for Jambray. Two players who have a great amount of respect for each other and are instrumental to the other's success a lot of, them to, uh, a lot of the time with them being firm practice partners. Uh, but there it is. Fury Hunter again showing his read on this metagame is just absolutely iron tight. He understands it so completely. And these uh, these combo decks that seem to be infesting the metagame right now, he's just the master of them. I rarely, if ever, can find a misplay with these style of decks from Fury. I completely agree with the no misplays part from Fury. The meta read, I'm not sure if this is quite proof of that because when are you ever going to run up into a lineup like Jumbrays again? But just the just fact that you. it it, it can beat meta decks, definitely, what Fury Hunter is bringing. And it also can beat the pure mad genius type of lineups as well. Is just boding well for our most recent Masters Tour champion. Perhaps a back-to-back -back in his future. We'll see if he can accomplish what only Blyze has done so far. But for John Brea as well, even though he's gone down for his first loss in the Swiss, he can still run it back up. I've got a lot of faith in these decks, honestly, just because John Brea knows them better than anyone else yeah. and I'd love to see him pull something out the bag later on. Yeah, agreed. And um, like I said, a couple bad beats for Jambre. This priest deck in particular is really not able to get its uh, its teeth into these games. We saw what it can do in that last game and I think he set it up gorgeously to get to that kind of critical mass that we often talk about with these miracle uh, priest decks where it did these disgusting things, cheating out just absurd amounts of mana. Uh, but Seemingly, I was wrong with regards to this Warlock deck. I had my mindset in the uh, the old Warlock versions that run, uh, obviously, the uh, the Soul Rend and the Unstable Shadow Blasts as the most impressive amount of damage. Like, if they could deal 15 damage to a board, I would be, or to one minion in particular, sorry, I would be stunned with the old version of the deck. But here with this new version, 12 damage AoE to everything seemed incredibly doable. It could even have been more with the Tams in as well, with a little bit more mana spare. Uh, and so, huge congratulations for Fury to find a uh, very clever uh, version of Warlock. I am sure it will be doing him 
very, very well as the uh, the day progresses. Uh, but we're of course all done with our first game of round two here at the start of Masters Tour Undercity. And when we come back from this break, we're going to get a look around the tavern to see what the rest of our competitors have got brewing up for us here this weekend. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to round number two of Master's Tour Undercity. My name is Don, joined by the wonderful Derek. You just came off of the casting desk with Gia. How was it going through that last series? A lot of fun. Two of my favorite boys, Fury Hunter and Jambre, going against it. And uh, while I love all my children equally and will not choose favorites, uh, I am, of course, uh, sad for Fury Hunter and uh, uh, sad for Jambre, sorry, and happy for Fury Hunter. But it does look like another really good start for our previous winner. So maybe we could be seeing our second back to back. Over the past couple of weeks, I've seen him grinding away in the practice servers uh, or the practice discords that we have with a lot of the other top players, like Fury Hunter and Jambre, who we've just seen. And he's come away with a very interesting lineup. Obviously, that Mozaki mage, which feels like the uh, the cornerstone of his strategy, what he almost built everything around, which has been banned away versus Idaho. So clearly, uh, already setting the stage for how powerful that deck could be going into the rest of the tournament. Uh, and jumping into game two with his Demon Hunter already having won, uh, we can see that Orange is 
in a reasonably good spot and I think should be able to uh, fight very well against Idaho's strategy. Uh, haven't had the chance to take too good of a look at the decks because uh, just coming off the previous uh, series. But if I had to guess, I would say that for uh, Orange now, his weak spot is potentially that Druid because leftover for Idaho, uh, obviously the Pirate Quest Warrior and a very spicy looking version of Mage, which is neither Weapon nor Garot, uh, of Rogue, sorry. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, too, talking about Druid as well. Looking at Idaho's Druid, it is actually a Taunt Druid, kind of that we've seen before. And I don't feel like a lot of players have brought this. We've been seeing quite a bit of this heavier, slower, kind of Anaconda, Celestial, Mally Ghost, you know, all of the things Druid before, just like Orange's List. Yeah. But it's going to be interesting to actually see how this taunt druid performs after all of these changes. But speaking of that druid, Orange is going to be queuing up that druid next after getting that win with the Demon Hunter. Yeah, and like I said, this is where things get a little shaky because uh, thank you for laying out uh, for the help of myself as well as the viewers at home that it is the, uh, the aggro taunt druid uh, for Idaho, which I think we're going to be seeing druid on druid here, uh, which is where things could get a little bit rough for Orange. This druid that he's got typically has been weak to, as I think some of the other casters have been joking about. Uh, it's been weak to cards. If your opponent plays stuff in the early game with this druid, generally you're going to be in a bit of a rough spot. Um, and given that Orange has gone for a fairly greedy build, I want to say. He doesn't have those Druids of the Reef in the early game, which make you a lot uh, more susceptible to early aggression. Maybe the Marks of the Wild go some way to counteract that, because you, of course, have Samuro in that mid game, which can get you tremendous amounts of board clear potential. That's a real revelation to slot that card in Druid. Uh, but again, if Orange can get over the finish line in this matchup, I think he's going to be in a premium position for the rest of the series. Uh, because as is often the case with Conquest, it's a story of your weakest deck, and whether or not he can get the win. And the weakest deck here, as I see it for Orange, is this Druid. Uh, and we even saw that in the first match, I feel like, that Gia and I were casting, where it really struggled in those first couple of games. It finally did take a win, but by then, it almost felt a bit too late, and there was going to have to be a lot of clawing back in the whole series as a whole. So, yeah, this could be a huge pivotal game here for Orange to to be able to try to take this game. I'm really curious to see what it is that Idaho is queuing up into this Druid as well. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, if our uh, tracking sheet is leading me correctly, it is going to be uh, the aggro Druid on the other side, the taunt Druid, uh, not the uh, the face hunter, as someone has erroneously <laughs> named it them. Uh, don't be mistaken. Uh, a deck that has gotten a little bit weaker with the most recent balance patch with Razor Main Battle Guard going down to a 2-2, uh, but quite correctly, uh, no reason to take it out of the deck. It is still very much uh, the beating heart of the deck because it allows you early game pushes by going for an early Annoyatron, an early Pack Mule, and it, of course, also allows you those really powerful late game pushes where you go Oracle of a Loon, Razor Main Battle Guard, and then double up on either Grey Bow or Teacher's Pet. And uh, if that bunch of uh, late game nonsense wasn't powerful enough already. Mr. Smite is, of course, coming in for a bit of an extra push uh, to close out the game, which is an addition that I think makes a lot of sense. It's often felt like the one weakness of this aggro druid deck is as soon as it loses board, it loses the game because it has very little reach. But now with Park Panther and Mr. Smite just to maybe deal six to nine damage in the late game, that can uh, just creep you, crawl you over the finish line uh, to be able to take down some of those decks that have uh, power spikes in terms of removal around turn six or seven. Yeah, and I feel like even with the mini set coming out too, things like the addition of Druid of the Reef have been very impactful for this deck. Uh, being able to get out an early taunt that has more health than all the other minions that oh, yeah. start the game out. I mean, I've seen games that it's able to get out on the board and it kind of just snowballs the game from there and sometimes it doesn't even get to that late game that you were talking about with those big swings we'll see if that's going to be the case here as we get into the first game with orange starting off with what looks to be some great answers here the lunar eclipse against a, a fairly aggressive deck looks like a good start yeah big fan of the lunar eclipse here 
Moonlight Guidance, or Moonlit Guidance, sorry, uh, is uh, a really interesting card in this early game because it's really allowed a great amount of flexibility in the Druid decks, being able to go Moonlight Guidance into Double Lightning Bloom, Double Umbral Owl, uh, are really ideally what you're looking to do in the mid game, uh, or Double Lunar Eclipse even is often a very, very powerful play that you see. Uh, but keeping it in the starting hand is really interesting from Orange because it allows you to obviously try and dig for those key cards, namely Overgrowth uh, is the main one you're looking for, but it of course massively lowers the power of the card because if you're playing it on turn two, it's really unlikely actually that you're going to be able to get that repeated effect and draw the card from the deck after you've discovered it as well. Uh, so I'm interested to see it kept here from Orange, but it could pay off in spades if he finds one of those key mid-game cards. <laughs> and for Idaho, tempoing out that uh, Razor Rain Battle Guard that you were mentioning earlier, mm. even with that effect, uh, the change to it, putting it at two health, it still was going to die to that solar e or the lunar eclipse, eclipse, excuse me, that <laughs> yeah. orange had. But I I'm kind of interested. There's not really a lot going on in hand and just drawing even more slow, slow cards. This is not the kind of pressure that Idaho is looking for, what but I I'm really kind of interested in that. Uh, choice to just tempo the battle guard. Yeah, Idaho obviously really not happy with this. I, I can understand why he did go for it because his hand was not looking good, right? And if he played it and it stuck around for one turn, he can then just very happily go peasant plus composting. Drawing two cards of composting uh, is fine in this mid game. You, you're rarely going to get much better than that unless you have an incredibly strong starting hand. Uh, it did not work out for him. Obviously, as you said, Orange had that uh, Lunar Eclipse. Uh, and now for Idaho, I do like that he's taking a step back. I think that going for peasant plus composting just to cycle an extra card was a little overly aggressive. It's a little pessimistic even, I would say. And in order to pull this one back, I think he needs to trust his deck to give him ways to develop huge amounts of uh, minions onto the board. Or even just rely on Arbor Up, Arbor Up on turns five and six. Like, that's not the worst thing I've ever heard of. Yeah. Oh, gonna find the pack hey. to be able to at least get something out onto the board. Not sure exactly. It almost looked like floated mana there. Nope, oh, okay. All right, so oh. we've gone a little bit ahead here. <laughs> it appears that the mule has now not only broken the client, but is actually able to travel through time to mess with the broadcast. Um, uh, but here we go. Uh, for uh, Orange versus Idaho, uh, on this uh, turn here, it does mean that... Um, uh, as I think the bottom half of the screen has caught up, but the top screen hasn't. I'm a little bit confused as with the uh, time manipulation that's going on here. But either way, as I was saying, I think what has come true is that Arbor Up into Arbor Up appears here, Dawn, uh, to have got Idaho into a pretty good position. Yeah, and even with the bit of the slow, uneventful starting hand, Idaho's been able to scrape something together and actually get on board. And with one of the Lunar Eclipses already being used earlier in the game, and... There's not a lot seemingly happening in Orange's hand, but this is where we finally see the Samuro, which does seem like it can be an odd inclusion, but paired with that survival of the fittest, an or an Orange found a fantastic answer to actually clear that board, and now Idaho is right back in that awkward position, but draws right into <laughs> that Mr. Smite to take the win there and tie the series one to one. That's right, just going to shiver his timbers with good old Mr. Smite to close it out there. Uh, it's obviously a little bit sad that we didn't get to see those middle turns there uh, for Idaho and uh, for Orange to see how he responded to that uh, pretty miserable start to the game for Idaho. But it just goes to show the power of uh, this deck, or really the the weakness of the, uh, the deck from Orange. Any kind of board push, even if it's just rubbish minions until turn five and then you just play a couple of Arbor Ups, that's often just good enough to get there and we'll be able to fight, uh, we'll be able to run over uh, the uh, slower Mr. Smite Druid, as it's uh, been dubbed for Orange there, uh, even though they both run Mr. Smite very confusingly. But the slower Celestial Alignment version for Orange is just very, very susceptible to a uh, push from the board. And uh, like I was saying, we're right back in that spot now for Orange where he hasn't won with that Druid. And I've got to say, Pirate Warrior doesn't sound much better. And this uh, weird miracle kind of rogue that you could call it for Idaho, uh, is also, I would argue, probably not a great matchup for the Druid. 
Yeah, it seems like this Druid definitely is going to be the weak point in the struggle there for Orange. Watching that replay, even having a board clear answer just was not enough against the pressure. And like I said, I would imagine we're going to continue seeing that from the other decks from Idaho. But look at this, Orange not running back this Druid, going to switch it over to the Weapon Rogue which has kind of come back into the into the scene here. We've been seeing people kind of t getting away from that Garot Rogue after the recent changes. Still a couple of Garot Rogues, but switching over to this Weapon Rogue to be able to push some insane amounts of damage. What What is it that Orange is going to be looking for with playing this Weapon Rogue? Yeah, Weapon Rogue is really all reliable in terms of Master Tours. It feels like you never see it on ladder, uh, but it always just crops up after uh, every single Master's Tour because, like you said, it serves a very specific purpose, which is generally to beat the combo decks before they can do their combo. And also to kind of target control decks, but control is fairly weak at the moment, so that's very much a, a tertiary aspect of the deck. Uh, because for Spell Mage, Mazaki Mage, Garot Rogue, uh, the Druid, as well, even the uh, the OTK Demon Hunters, apologies. Uh, this rogue can often just get there a little bit quicker, especially now that you have access to Mr. Smite. That is a really crucial inclusion in the deck, which allows you to ramp up the damage drastically with the extra pirates to buff their attack uh, a huge amount. But as I was talking about, here for Idaho, Tempo Rogue is, I guess, a good a name as any for him here, uh, with what is a really, really cool deck, and one that I'm glad to see is utilizing new new Edwin as Defias Kingpin here, which, although it doesn't feel like it necessarily slots into Garot Rogue or Weapon Rogue especially well, is still just a brutally powerful card. Yeah, and even taking advantage of the Scab's Cutter Butter to try to get mm. discounts, cheat things out, there could be very, very huge swing turns with this deck. I mean, we've already seen that with all of the different variations of Rogue. I'm expecting this to follow that same pattern as well. It's it's going to be very interesting. Now, going into this matchup, we see it is going to be Rogue versus Rogue. What do you kind of expect to, to play out with this matchup is you, you were talking about the importance of those big swings that Orange could potentially put out against more slow and control type decks. But how is that going to play out against this Tempo Rogue? That can be a real weird one uh, because this deck... I would have to guess, because the bottom half of the deck is essentially the same as Garot Rogue, where you have uh, all the cheap minions, you have the field contact, and you have the Octobot as well. If you can draw that portion of the deck and play it all out on turn four or earlier, you're in a good spot. You're probably going to aggro the, uh, the Weapon Rogue out of the game, because you will kill them before they can kill you. But if you miss even a small amount of that. If you're floating even a little bit of mana in the early turns, the Weapon Rogue will punish you heavily with the raw amount of damage and then, of course, the Cloak of Shadows in the mid game to deny that extra push of damage. So for Idaho, this kind of hand he's got here is pretty much crucial, I would say, to have a chance in the matchup. Uh, and he will obviously be very happy to see what is a very strong hand here with Foxy Fraud Swindle to fill out any... Uh, card draw questions he may have had with this hand and even just a couple of one uh two ones with the guardian org merchants are just a lot of pressure yeah and being able to point it out just start with this immediately oh, yeah. get something on board it seems like in an insanely fantastic start finding the neophyte too already that just fills in that curve even more hmm. well Does Orange feel comfortable just playing the tempo? Octobot is... It's a tough one, tough. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Octobot is very unlikely to be killed in response by Idaho. Uh, but the benefit that he gets off of that is pretty good to be fair he does get to play the entire rest of his hand he just needs to think is that a uh, is that a winning game plan if he goes for that and just vomits everything onto the board he could leave himself very much vulnerable to drawing off the top of his deck uh, but i guess he's saying he's vulnerable to that anyway it's not like he increases his card draw by holding on to the octobot so he's just slamming it i think it makes a little bit of sense too there's already a follow-up play if the octobot just gets cleared without triggering the effect which mm. like you said does seem mm. unlikely but getting the the swine 
uh, the swine tusk into the deadly poison. Oh, yeah. It's a great follow up with the discounts, too. And maybe it can start to snowball the game. There's the raider to follow up as well. But Idaho oh, does seem like there's a good solid hand for him as well. So it's going to be really interesting. I think Orange just really needs to find them draw to really continue filling in the rest of this, this kind of curve and game plan that he's already started to formulate. Interesting, yeah. I don't just going with dagger and a swing to clear it off. And I've got to say, this is not generally the way that I would advocate playing against weapon uh, against weapon rogue because I like to just go as wide as I can as soon as I can. Because if he'd just gone with uh, bump into the octobot and then uh, or I guess, sorry, I should say, you go with one Org Merchant on your own uh, Foxy Fraud and then bump into the Octobot, the other Org Merchant on the one health Octobot left over, and then you end up with a 3-1 and 2-2 two, two ones at the end of that turn. That's just a lot more damage. That's something that uh, Orange is going to have to chew through in the coming turns. Whereas now for Idaho, you know, he saved the Org Merchants to potentially go with Field Contact. But that's a long way away. Like, turn five is the late game in this matchup. That's not the mid game. And so I think I would have advocated for just a slightly more aggressive push here and start to convert some of this card advantage into board control. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you there as well. Maybe there's consideration of, I mean, like you said, the field contact feels really far away still. Idaho might have been hoping to just save it no, one more turn no. and potentially try to draw into an octobot of his own there and then go in on that and it really wouldn't be as possible to to use that efficiently with having used the Og Merchants already, but the Shadow Step certainly makes the field contact uh, a bit better. Okay, Swindle, a real nice pickup for Orange to... Uh start juicing this hand a little bit more if he can get himself the silver leaf poison or a uh, what am i thinking of cutting class then it feels like his card draw problems should be uh cleaned up for the rest of this game and uh there it is cutting class in hand a couple of blood sail raiders as well a lot of damage that he can start pushing now and it's very much on uh, idaho to start converting this uh, as i said this card advantage into actual pressure into board control to try and close out the game it's quiet, yeah, and, and quiet. going wide That's against rogue in general Nothing. typically over hearthstone's history uh, at least especially once a you know like fan of knives and some of those things left standard going wide like you mentioned is just such a fantastic line against another rogue whether that's in a mirror match or just whatever deck you're playing if you can go wide but it's, it's so difficult for that rogue to deal with and maybe this line that idaho has taken is just going to be a little bit too slow but not being able to apply that pressure is, is this giving orange enough time to potentially find like a back-to-back -back cloak setup i think it's possible yeah he's got uh, a lot of time because right now i mean Obviously, he can't play Cloak, but he does not need to play Cloak on this turn uh, because he's just not under that much pressure. Even leaving the, uh, um, sorry, the field contact alive, it's not that bad, right? Again, this is not Garot Rogue for Idaho, so it's not like if he allows the field contact to survive, he is necessarily going to be dead to a bunch of Garots in the coming turns. Uh, Idaho can uh, will, again, I think kind of struggle to convert that card advantage into a whole bunch of damage. I, I'm curious if Idaho is going to be going for trying to take advantage of the scabs try to get a big swing turn like you're talking about to, to change that advantage, but I I don't wow. know if it's going to happen fast enough. Orange actually goes with a clear as well, which I was a little surprised to see. I was kind of right there with you where I thought that just punching face every turn would be able yeah. to get him there. Uh, but he disagrees, going for the board control route, which uh, after a pretty lackluster secret passage might leave himself uh, very much reliant on getting a good, uh, good card draw because now for Idaho, any concerns I might have had about not applying enough pressure are very much answered because this push with scabs and a whole bunch of uh, raggedy one drops are going to be pushing a huge amount of damage. 
Yeah, they they don't look very menacing on their own, but when they start forming that ragtag team of little one drops all together, oh, yeah. it starts to really get scary. And again, Orange is in this position where he is just missing that draw. And at this point, maybe holding these Blood Seal Raiders to find a Mr. Smite. But now is he in the position that that's just too slow trying to go for one solid big swing turn? We'll have to see. I mean, Orange has now got... He's just, he still needs probably another poison or, of course, Mr. Smite itself would be a fantastic draw in the next couple of turns. And with the Shroud off the top, maybe it can be said Mr. Smite. And now we are looking at an awful lot of damage, right? This is 6, 12 from the weapon and Mr. Smite. And then I believe another 8 from the one mana Blood Sail Raider for just 20 damage next turn. Yeah, finding that Mr. Smite off Am of the I concealment feels huge. I, <laughs> along with that discount from Orange early on, playing that Tempo Octobot set this up. I, I, there's, there's other minions in the deck, but there's actually less minions in this version than, let's say, the, the deck that Idaho is running. Mm. And we're really kind of seeing that discrepancy here as well, where Orange, it almost felt like Orange really got to set up this whole grand scheme of things. And you can see Idaho's reaction there as these pirates come onto the board. Yeah, giving him a big clap. Pretty upset about that one, actually, it looks like from Idaho. And you can understand why, for me, Weapon Rogue is one of my, uh, I don't know, my bugbears of Hearthstone. I fully understand where he's coming from because it just feels like there's nothing you can do when you're at the receiving end of it. They just swing at the we uh, with the weapon at you a few times and then you just fall apart before their eyes. Uh, but I think overall it was well piloted by Orange. Um, whether or not he should have killed the contact is something I'm not 100% sure on, but I will, I will uh, definitely defer to Orange on that one, that he will more often make a better call than I will. Um, and again, the only thing from Idaho, I would argue, on the other hand, is when I really boil it all down, whether or not it was worth it to actually coin out the Foxy Fraud on turn one is, I think, the biggest question I have. Because it all led to these couple turns where he went coin Foxy Fraud into Dagger, which is just a very slow few turns. And maybe with a slightly different um, deviation of his resources, he could have got lethal one crucial turn earlier. Yeah, or, or maybe even just having more of an aggressive follow-up to that, you know, coin play that you talked about, just going in on it, kind of committing to that line if he was going to take that, because he had the, the follow-up of just a dagger felt a little bit questionable and kind of almost seemed like opposites of what he was going for initially. So, yeah, that could have been a detriment for him in that game, but that does mean that Orange is up two to one now in the series and just has to get a win with that druid is it gonna happen that's right it's just the weak link left it's it's so often how it works with conquest it's a, a cruel mistress indeed because you feel like you're ahead and undeniably orange is in the head you have to have really really bad matchups to not be favored in the series when you're two one up uh, but i would argue that they're not great matchups they might not be terrible but they're not fantastic as uh, idaho if we think what he did in that previous game that's probably not going to be a weapon rogue but it's almost certainly going to be a druid if he can do anything similar to that in this game i really think orange will struggle to keep up yeah, I, I don't even know. There's not a lot of removal options for Orange. There are the couple of Lunar Eclipses, maybe finding the Owls, which, yeah. you know, potentially the Samuro that we saw that did come out and, and attempt to slow down the Aggro Druid board earlier. But it's not really a lot. And if there's going to be a huge aggressive push from Idaho. Yeah, I, I don't know where Orange is going to find the resources to keep up with it. So it's going to be kind of up in the air. Maybe Orange has to go for a different line of thinking. Mm. It'd be tough. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that you can go about it with this deck because there's the alignment half and the non-alignment half <laughs> yeah. of the deck. And the lines get very blurred after you've played it. Uh, 
But I will say that just going for an all-out turn three or four celestial alignment uh, can very much win you the game because Rogue tops out at like four mana. So if they're playing a four Get mana card as the only friend. play on their turn, you're going to be able to easily outpace that as Druid after alignment. Uh, and we do see uh, Orange, even if he wasn't necessarily hard digging for the alignment, did take a pretty aggressive mulligan throwing away the Owl and the Lightning Bloom. Uh, and so he's clearly digging for something a little bit more ambitious uh, than what he could have got with just an early owl. And to be fair, he's got a pretty good hand going Jerry Rig into Overgrowth into hopefully some nonsense with the Anaconda is pretty strong. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's lining up really nicely and keeping that discount from the nature studies into that Overgrowth like you talked about is just, it's so good to set up and if Idaho can't find a draw for himself, it feels like he might just be a sitting duck. Man, that neophyte alone is just so brutal, isn't it? The difference between playing overgrowth and not playing overgrowth. I mean, it's the difference between winning and losing. It's pretty simple. This game plan has gone from looking gorgeous for Orange to just looking like uh, a whole load of rubbish. Oh. Well, does Idaho want to just redo that? Is there is there a line where just shadow step that neophyte, replay it, and go? I think so. If we remember what his deck actually is, like we can define it as Temper Rogue, but it's uh, an aggressive board-based rogue. With a fair bit of burst damage, we have to remember Wicked Stab does a lot of damage once you hit that uh, and it gets up to rank 2 once turn 5 rolls around. And so just pushing damage while he can, taking his chip damage where he can get it. If Orange wants to play Overgrowth alone on this turn, he can be Idaho's guest because he will very likely be dead in the next couple turns. Yeah, I'm already facing down 9 damage on the board. Sitting at 13 is not a comfortable position for Orange to be in at all. Those, that Neo fight, especially back-to-back -back Neo fights, really slowed this game laying down for Orange. It was looking really good. I was with you. That line, but now that Neo fight just completely stopped that whole Ooh. play in its tracks. <laughs> uh, that's Mr. Smite. <laughs> That's a card. Both of those statements were true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What can Orange pull out of his hat now to save himself from this one? Because while Mr. Smite currently represents guaranteed lethal, these marks of nature might be able to be the, uh, or Mark of the Wild, sorry, not Mark of Nature, uh, for Orange, might be the difference maker that can allow him to taunt up, erect the walls, and uh, hide behind them. I, oh. That might have to be the line that Orange goes for. Is... Mm -hmm. <sighs> oh. I don't envy... That position that he's in there, just such an awkward, uncomfortable position. He just well, has guess... to go for it and hope he hope it's good enough. Yes, so I'm trying to think exactly how do you do this, because I feel like Anaconda plus Marks are pretty crucial to this turn. I'm just wondering if you go coin Moonlit and hope for Owls, because I'm trying to think how cheap the Owls would be. I don't think they'd be quite at zero unless you go for the Bloom as well which is obviously very tempting, but in the end, he's just going coin hero power, which keeps him one health out of range of a, uh, a wicked stab off the top. Yeah, I mean, good thinking there. He's already seen one, so it seems a little less likely that the second one would be there available to give Idaho that lethal, but it's still a possibility, and if Orange is already going for the... I'm going to do what I can and hope I'm not dead. Yeah, that hero power fits sufficient. in perfectly with that. Idaho finally getting some use out of these brain freezes that have just been clogging up his hand for the entire game. And to be fair to him, he's got himself in the exact same situation as last turn. Mr. Smite will end the game unless Orange can pull a miracle out of his bag.
Or, <laughs> I feel like last turn was even one of those turns where it seemed Orange was really grasping to just stay alive. Is there anything he can find now at that point? Now that that Anaconda and both of the Mark of the Wilds are, are gone? Yeah, there was scenario Ward. That was pretty much the last chance, I yeah. think, for Orange here to be able to turn it around. Uh, best in Shell is a one-of in his deck, I believe, which maybe would have been enough, to be fair. Uh, and he would have then, of course, drawn another one from his deck after he played this one, which for a two-turn, best in shell into best in shell, maybe that would have been enough to be able to fight back against Mr. Smite. Uh, but with neither of those two options being found, uh, his only chance is to say, okay, the card in hand is not Mr. Smite, and it's not... Uh, uh, sorry, it's not Wicked Stab. He actually knows that it's not Wicked Stab or he would be dead on this turn. Uh, but he just needs to pray that it's not Mr. Smite and then maybe he can turn it around next turn. As we can see though, Idaho, after such a scrappy game, so nearly just running dry and completely dead on resources, takes us to game five. I feel like exactly what you were talking about. We're, we're really seeing this Druid struggle here. And now it has come down to this game number five. So it's going to be the Druid versus the uh, Warrior now for yeah. Idaho. That still in the same vein, that aggressive, really damage oriented Warrior. And I, if it goes anything like that last game, it's going to be quite a struggle for Orange. <laughs> It is indeed. Uh, taking a closer look at the uh, the warrior deck for Idaho, so we get a rundown of the, the beating he put on Orange in this game. Uh, it is a relatively aggressive one, um, because we've seen the builds change quite drastically as the uh, uh, the meta has developed. We've seen Barov go in and out. We've seen Rancor go in and out. Uh, now Idaho has gone with two man the cannons as the kind of removal card that he's gone for in the list, which it feels like most lists uh, are going for, given that you can only run so many pirates in the deck. And he's also got, also got one provoke. Those are kind of going to be the dead cards, as I would see it in the matchup, where you just want as many stats as you can play on every turn as possible. But for the most part, I would say it's just a very well-suited deck for the matchup, where it's just pirate after pirate after pirate, which is the last thing that Druid wants to see. They're high health, high attack minions very efficiently statted for the mana cost and a lot of them have to be removed the turn you play them like Defias Cannoneer or the South Sea Captain lest you take a huge amount of damage. And you can see as the one of those key cards that Cannoneer that you're talking about that in combination with weapon swings completing the second portion of the quest. I mean, those are massive amounts of damage. That's essentially hunter uh, hero power damage without really having to do much at all. And it it's definitely something I, I feel like we kind of tested this a lot in our, our preparation before the Masters Tour, where even up against this Druid, a lot of those cannon hits were just going face because there there wasn't anything coming out from the druid to get in the way to try to soak up those cannon hits. So that was just extra damage that was going right to face, just playing into the warrior's plan. No, you're absolutely right, Dawn. It, it's really tough for the Druid to keep up, uh, I find, in these uh, early turns. Uh, I will say that in terms of a, a, a realistic strategy that Orange can, can go for, uh, number one, I would say, is still just find an early alignment because... Warrior, similarly to the Rogue, tops out pretty low. The biggest card by far is Mr. Smite, uh, or Rakara, if the quest has been completed. And so if you can play the uh, Celestial Alignment before they find Rakara, or generate Rakara, I should say, that can be a very realistic win condition. Uh, and so Orange here going for a, uh, a keep on the Lady Anaconda is not necessarily the same plan, I was saying, with the alignment, but it kind of feeds into a similar strategy where it's a great card if you find the alignment. And even if you don't, it sets up for a really powerful pop-off turn with all the nature spell discounting. Yeah, it's really interesting as well to see this version, these versions we're starting to see now after all of this testing and these players submitting their decks, these heavier Druid decks, they still run this Anaconda, but they're not going in on Anaconda. Like, you know, it's, it's not Anaconda full power, 
get a huge board with like four anachondras and and play a bunch of zero cost things it's it's just the one anachondra but often like you said that just discounting by two is enough to get other things going in the deck to draw towards other plans that orange might have this owl in hand maybe could do something but Hmm, a conundrum I don't know if it's going to be enough. There's a lunar eclipse. There's some answers. It just depends on how fast Idaho can start to get these pirates out. Exactly right. Uh, Idaho, uh, Idaho, apologies, here going with double pirate right now as opposed to South Sea Captain uh, and then other pirates next turn. It means that he loses out on the battle cry of the Foxail Freebooter because he could have got the weapon and then played the Foxail Freebooter next turn. Uh, but it gets more pirates online so that his captain buffs more cards immediately when it comes down, which is, I think, a very worthwhile trade-off. So I like this sequencing from Idaho. Yeah, absolutely. Giving the, the trade-off of the damage now for additional damage later. Right. That Lunar Eclipse coming out. It's not going to be able to take out the captain because it's coming out now, but it does slow down a little bit of that damage at least. And Orange able to also pull off some ramps, so maybe we're going to be able to work towards playing more things here in just a moment. But going to need even more spells to continue discounting that owl further. That's right, and this is the other benefit of Idaho's play is he gets the captain down post uh, Lunar Eclipse, right? Orange has now already expended uh, his key removal piece, uh, as unfortunately it looks like we're having... Another slight spectator issue with Orange's hand, which hopefully, uh, there we go, will get sorted as soon as possible. Um, I don't think this was a skip ahead either because he was at six mana uh, already on this turn. Uh, In terms of the options we're looking at here, Guardian Animals can obviously pull Owls, but I'm not especially interested. (laughs) There's only one left in the deck. Uh, And so probably, yeah, the power of the wild does make just a little more sense. Yeah, it's, it's just another cheap spell to try to work towards getting that owl out on this turn. It's not really doing a whole lot on its own, but pairing it with that owl to be able to get that owl out and remove damage off the board. A decent amount of damage, I would say, getting to remove that captain off the board. Oh, Idaho in an absolute state as he top decks shiver their timbers. One of the only cards in his deck that just leaves him with absolutely nothing to do. Uh, I mean, he can clear this panther, but that really is not what you're looking to do in this situation at all. He really, really, really wanted a pirate here to get those cannons fired. And that's exactly what he didn't get. So now Orange gets a full turn of just nothing happening from Idaho, (laughs) which is how he can turn this one around. Picks up the Samuro, but it's not going to be buffed and there's no more spells to put in combination with it to clear this board. Uh, Is it just maybe a Scenarian Ward to hope that there's enough armor and maybe a Taunt Minion? To, to stem this damage coming through. But how much health is that? He would go up to 16. Idaho is currently representing 6, 7, 8. So I think he's... If Idaho has Smite in hand, he's representing lethal through the Scenarian Ward, right? Because his, his Smite would have been buffed up multiple times by the Whetstone Hatchet in hand. Which means that if Orange wants to play around Smite, which is a very good read based on Idaho's hand, he cannot go for that line of just playing the Scenarium Ward. He needs to go for Malagos and hope to hit Bloom plus Mark of the Wild, which are literally the last two cards he draws off of the Malagos. If it hadn't been exactly those two to round it out, he was making a play that just left him dead. Little did he know if he'd just played the Scenarium Ward, he would have won that game anyway. But for Orange, what a play to make based on the information he had available. It was such a risk, but a risk that just uh, paid off unbelievably uh, well for him here. As now, what can Idaho do? Look at the size of this Mali. And even previously used that five damage, Shiver Their Timbers, to clear off that 3-2 can't even put that five damage towards trying to get through this this Mally Ghost here. But like you said, incredible, incredible draws from Orange. And on top of that, also finding that second solar 
to be able to also <laughs> clear something at the same time as getting this gigantic Mally Ghost out on the board. All right. I see a Guidance. That can help find even more stuff. I kind of like that. Definitely don't mind that. I see that. I see a lot of turtles, which also I think <laughs> would be able to get you the win. Best in Shell into Best of Shell feels like a very, very strong game plan. Um, I guess Orange is maybe starting to get a little afraid of his health total because if the next card is Cannoneer, then theoretically he could leave himself vulnerable to four cannons all face, which is very unlikely, I know, but it's... Uh, a possibility, uh, and he needs to value how far ahead he thinks he is now in this game. None can stand against the third floor. Oh, look at this. Just gonna continue with that same line of, I'm going to put out a gigantic taunt minion, and I don't think you can do anything about it. We see Idaho clapping there as the concede comes out to the quote unquote weakest deck of the lineup that you were talking about, Derek, gets the win finally for Orange in game number five. So he actually does take the series. That has to feel good. It does, yeah. It's the kind of play that looks a lot cooler if you can't see your opponent's hand because as i said orange is making the play around mr smite which like i said was a very reasonable read to make that it was mr smite in hand instead of man the cannons so he made this very risky play which could have just fallen flat on his face uh, as a result of obviously he probably wins the game anyway but the line he went for is a little bit riskier i think uh, with the information he had available was just such a master stroke from orange to go for it here and uh showed this shows that he is back on form once again you cannot put orange down he comes back every masters tour and uh puts up incredible results we love to see this very high level of play with a deck like her uh, druid that Sometimes it's given a reputation of just being a little bit simple. You curve up, you play your big cards and hope that that's good enough. Uh, but Orange pu uh, putting any of those rumors to rest with a very high skill game there. Yeah, and, and showing why he has been around and done so well over his long career in the game. But oh, congratulations to him for sure. But before we get into any more breaks or anything like that, we actually have one more game to show you. It is going to be a game number five between Silvors and Mega Gliscor. Indeed, yeah. Mega Gliscor currently one of the uh, the front runners for APAC GM. So a player that I very much got my eyes on uh, with plenty of spots available actually for APAC Grandmasters next season. What with uh, us having a few retirements of our key players like Surrender and Blitzchung in particular. Uh, leaving us with open spots of Mega Gliscor very, very likely to be a GM next season unless uh, many other APAC players randomly decide that this for the first time is going to be a good Masters Tour for APAC players. Uh, Alutemu doesn't count. Him coming second place twice is uh, its separate. He's hes not human, so he cannot count uh, as an APAC Grandmasters player. He's just too good. Uh, but for Mega Gliscor, clearly in a good spot as he's 1-0 up overall in terms of the series. In a 2-2 situation here with, uh, with Mage up against Demon Hunter. And uh, obviously I haven't had a chance to look at the decks available. Uh, but if it's a Mazaki Mage that he has against the Demon yes. Hunter, I'm thinking he's probably in a pretty good spot. I feel like it just does the combo thang a little bit quicker. Yeah, and it is that Mazaki Mage versus, it looks like the kind of uh, quest OTK style of Demon Hunter, but this Demon Hunter also is running a Magtheridon. I, you know, I still don't know how great that is going to be against the mage necessarily, <laughs> especially with the mage having access to uh, some freeze spells to slow that down further. But uh, real quickly, before we get into that game itself, let's take a little bit of a look at uh, some stats on Silvoras. Can you kind of walk us through his performances? Yeah, I mean, he's just one of those players that's been in competitive Hearthstone for a uh, an incredibly long time. It's, uh, I don't know, I think it's partially my fault as well that I maybe don't uh, get as much information. I feel like uh, with the... Uh 
uh, the more Eastern European players. I don't necessarily uh, reach out to them as much as rest of the uh, the European squad. It feels like generally there's slightly more uh, language barrier in the way. But for Silvos, again, as I was saying, I think that he has just been one of the cornerstones of competitive Hearthstone for a very, very long time. Seven wins at Orgrimmar and Yongchaping is, of course, uh, nothing to turn your nose up at. And if he wasn't in the most competitive of regions in Europe, maybe it would be a, a very different story for Silvos in terms of his uh, Grandmaster's run. Uh, but a 56% win rate to uh, to boast is uh, a very impressive uh, record to have to your name, uh, as there are many players that have uh, achieved far more than Silvers who have had far less good uh, win rates in terms of uh, their Master Soul win rate. So I think Silvers can hold his head high over that one. And uh, going with the Demon Hunter here, as you said, the Magtheridon is a card that's a little bit of a question mark in Demon Hunters. I know that Orange is a player who brought it last Masters Tour after being told by Pocket Train and uh, Fury Hunter that he should not do so, regretted it afterwards, and since then transitioned back to the Rust Rot Viper, as most players are going for. Uh, but to be fair, with this specific metagame, this Masters Tour, with a lot of aggro, a lot of board-based decks, Magtheridon does make sense to me. Yeah, it's definitely one of those cards that I feel like we've seen kind of off and on. So it's, it's like you said, a bit of a question mark. We're gonna see how it ends up playing out in the match, but let's take a look at uh, some information on Mega Gliscor. You talked already about all of the performances there, but 15th Masters Tour board, so many Masters Tour, and maybe not the, the incredible 56% win rate, but still a very right. solid win rate with 52% across those Masters Tours and over 15 Masters Tours. That is still an incredibly solid win rate. Yeah, I, I think for Mega Gliscor, uh, I'm not sure where he is now, but I think at the start of the previous Masters Tour, uh, Glory, our current world champion, another uh, Japanese player, obviously, had a worse win rate than that in Masters Tour. So at the very least, he can hold that uh, over his head uh, for Mega Gliscor, as it's uh, a very interesting spot that Mega Gliscor is in. And the Japanese Hearthstone community in general, because obviously in Asia Pacific, Possessi Glory and Alutemu in uh, APAC Grandmasters have just been absolutely tearing it up. Like it, it feels like there's such a big gap between them and everyone else below them, especially uh, now that Surrender has announced his retirement from Grandmasters. But the rest of the players, Okashinsuke and Trahizen this last season, haven't really felt like they've been able to keep up with that classic mix of the three unbeatable Japanese Hearthstone players. And so for Mega Gliscor, obviously there's a, a big legacy that he has to try and live up to. But at the same time, it's not only being compared to other players from your own country. It is, of course, just about trying to uh, forge your own reputation, which I'm sure he will be trying to do. And so to get things started here with the Mazaki Mage, Encanter's Flow in the starting hand, obviously exactly what you're looking for, and already off to a great start in the final game of his second series here. Absolutely, that coin into Encanter's Flow is definitely a fantastic start. It feels like kind of no matter which uh, mage is being run, that coin in Encanter's Flow can definitely make <laughs> a huge difference. In but... Uh, this acrobatics not seeming like it a terrible thing either for silvers. Uh, yeah, acrobatics is a, a weird one in the starting hand because on one aspect, on one hand, I absolutely agree with you. It's a way to get the quest done nice and quickly at the start uh, and uh, just give you some guaranteed card draw. Uh, on the other hand, it's the card draw effect I would most like to have after Kurtris because you're so likely to be able to get the secondary effect as well and draw four cards off of the acrobatics. Um, so I'm not going to be jumping up and down for joy quite yet here for Silvors, but it could be a very good start to the game, especially if he gets either Sigil Runner uh, or Spectral Sight off of this Illidari Studies. Yeah. <laughs> kind of seeming like he's really deciding if he actually wants to go for it, but does end up going for it here. And also of note, interestingly, on the other side, that lab partner being found too. Definitely a great spell damage minion to be found, but not really doing a whole lot for Mega Score at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I was a 
little surprised to see it played down, if I'm honest. It's one of those cards that I would rather keep for a mid-game cram session, because you don't always necessarily save cram session for Mozaki, or you don't save both of them, I should say, to draw a million. Uh, here for Silvors, though, picking up Spectral Sight off the top is fantastic, but finding zero card draw options, zero tradables to go alongside it, is just an absolute disaster, and uh, means that now, boy oh boy, is he not in a good situation. Glide next turn is really the best he can hope for, and then just pray that he gets some good card draw after that as well. Yeah, card draw definitely seems to be something that I think in, in quite a few of these matchups we've already seen for the day is really t kind of been the detriment where if yeah. the player is able to find the card draw, then they can keep the pressure going or they can keep finding those cards that they need. But not finding the card draw is just so detrimental. And we can see that here. Like you mentioned, that mid-game potential with Lab Partner Cram Session, but it is just not in the hand. And still multiple turns before that refreshing spring water can come down for more draw as well. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see the discover options uh, for Mega Gliscor. I was going to say the real premium option for me this turn was... Uh, Steward of Scrolls, uh, to be able to spend four mana, discover a spell next turn, leading into Spring Water on five. Uh, couldn't see what the other options were, obviously, but for Mega Gliscor, finding Aegwin there is interesting. If the next card is Mazaki, just starting off with plus two spell damage certainly does not hurt. Oh! How is it even possible? <laughs> oh, Silver's just not having a good game here. Didn't want to go with the glide, instead taking a risk, which I can understand for with the acrobatics. But it is a risk that does not pay off, my goodness. No, oh, and it's so unfortunate looking at the way that the game is played out if you're a Silvers fan, because <laughs> it is now turn five, and I I don't believe he's even completed the first part of the quest yet. Like nope. he should be almost completed with the whole thing by now. What what is going on? This is not how he wants to be playing this game at all. Exactly. Bring an APAC GM back again, as I often do. If this was Alutemu, he'd be playing Kurtras <laughs> on this turn. It wouldn't even be close. Uh, but yes, obviously now this is looking so favored for Mega Gliscor. Like, I don't know. If Silvos could somehow maneuver an outcast glide to shuffle back in a huge hand, uh, I think it could work out fantastically for him. Uh, but even, Mega Gliscor is even working around that very well because obviously he went for uh, a play we didn't talk about at the time. Uh, but brain freezing his own minion there was absolutely correct, in my opinion, because it just means that he is keeping his hand size nice and small. If an outcast glide does come down, as it was very reasonable to expect it would, uh, then he would just be shuffling in a much smaller hand and therefore drawing a larger percentage of his deck with the extra four cards that he gets. Uh, so he played around a play that his opponent isn't even lucky enough to be able to do. Uh, and so for that reason, I think Mega Gliscor can just be uh, very happy with how this game is proceeding. Absolutely. Guess what? There's finally some draw. Turn six. All right, it's happening. Okay, discounted Ilganoth and double fell screen blast. That like maybe opens up possibilities for non kurtrus lethal to be found. Maybe. Could be there. There's already the one talented Arcanist and one Moarg in hand as True. well. I think at this point, this really needs to hope that the game goes long enough to be able to play all of that out. Yeah, I don't think that's happening either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's looking like a, a pipe dream at this point. Oh, and because of the extra spell damage that uh, comes from uh, Aegwyn onto this multicaster, like, each of these cram sessions are drawing three cards now as well for Mega Gliscor. Like, he's just reaching the bottom of his deck next turn without even needing to play Mozaki cram session. Yeah, uh, Mega Gliscor is just kind of rubbing it in Silver's face at this point. <laughs> Look at all of this card draw that I have. I wish you had this card draw, but it's, it's so impactful. Like you said that... Uh, that additional spell damage really coming into play throughout this entire game basically since that 
Aegwyn came down, but it's uh, it's kind of interesting, too, because there's actually two copies of the multicaster in this list. Uh, I know in the, yeah. the opening series uh, Gia and I got to cast, we talked about the difference between one and two a little bit. But yeah, this version has two, so might make it a little bit more difficult uh, to find that, that Mazaki if there's some sort of draw effect. But no Mazaki yet. Silvor spending his... Uh setup turn, I guess, on going for, uh, I don't know, maybe if he could shuffle back in Mazaki here with this star student Stalina, uh, he can slow his opponent down a little bit. Uh, and obviously the main point of this play is to set up for Glide uh, next turn to be able to shuffle all of this back in. Uh, but honestly, there are draws just for lethal right here now for Mega Gliscor with the extra mana he has available for Kunja Mana Biscuit. Bill did not find Mazaki, though. There is mm. not very many cards left in the deck for Mega Gliscor. This is stalling his plan just a little bit. But if there is that glide, that definitely can change things up. The second multicaster coming into play here. Oh, not enough mana to play the other Encanter's Flow there. Yeah, he could if he wanted to go for uh, the one mana biscuit and then obviously uh, conjure mana biscuit and then play the biscuit but uh i doubt that's worth it to be honest i think i'd rather save that uh, because you've drawn most of your deck anyway at this point flow is really not yeah. doing that much yeah exactly i mean so now looking at at Silver's side though all right we've seen a little bit of this come down do you think it is just the glide at this point, even though there's this discounted Ilganoth and the double the double fell scream blast? Is is that what Silver wants to be going for? Uh yeah, I think so. Like if we look at how much damage this can deal, right? If he gets himself, I don't know, Moog next card is probably the biggest damage ramp. He can go Ilganoth, Moog, Fell Scream, and then Arcanist Fell Scream. That's even if there are three minions to target with the first fell screen blast. That's still only like twenty four damage, I think, uh, at that point, which doesn't even scratch this. Like even without the armor, Mega Gliscor's got more health than that at that point. Uh, yeah, and so I think for Silvers, absolutely, he's doing the right thing here in just going for the uh, the glide. Pray that his opponent doesn't get any card draw, and then from there, it's salvageable. It's not likely. But it's technically salvageable uh, for Silvors if he can get down Kurtris on turn nine. Yeah, it's definitely a, a bit of a interesting way that this has kind of panned out for Silvors. We've talked about just completing the second part of the quest finally. So still has to complete that third part of the quest and then get the Kurtris down. And I... How much draw is even left after the Kurtris comes down? A, a little bit because none of it was really found early on in the game, but it also looks like he's really kind of starting to get down to the end of his deck as well. But going to be able to draw some of those combo pieces, like finding that Ilganoth back again. Uh, yeah, again, apologies to the viewers at home. We are working with incomplete information here because we don't have deck tracker, uh, deck sizes uh, available, or deck tracker for that matter, available on this yeah, cast. So this? we're just kind of having to eyeball and figure out uh, from memory how many cards they have left Another in deck. Uh, but like you say, I'd be surprised if Mega Gliscor has more than like 11, 12 cards in deck, probably less. Um, even with all the cards that were shuffled back in, uh, of course. Uh, and so this evocation that he's picked up I mean, honestly, with the way it's going, he could theoretically get there without even playing Mazaki, just like launching Burn to face. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of potential, and it's gotten to the point in the game where this evocation is going to leave plenty of mana to work with after it's played as well. Oh, and, you know, and a biscuit too. Might as well. It's it's there. Yeah, I guess you start Freeze, yeah, on the uh, Kurtris. Okay, wow. <laughs> some damage in this hand. That is some serious damage. So you can go for Primordial Studies to get spell damage. Would not be ridiculous. Um, and then Fireball plus Ignite. Uh, assuming you get a one or two mana spell damage card. 
is he okay i was like is he just considering the mask <laughs> that that seems maybe questionable there's a lot of help on the board but yes yeah, does look like starting off with the uh studies there okay not bad picks up some extra spell damage for cheap not funny uh, okay holding on to the cobalt to go with a cram session afterwards yeah that makes sense I think it's very reasonable considering that the hand is now pretty empty after those yeah. location cards are dumped. And we don't have the exact numbers, like you said, but again, not very many cards, it looks like, left for either player here. And here for Silvers, though, with Glide off the top, although it's not doing much to his opponent's hand, arguably making it better a lot of the time, what it might do is just give him lethal. If he can get Ilganoth some spell damage, uh, obviously the lifesteal spell with the Fell Screen Blast, this could just be game over right now. But these cards as it currently stands are not going to be good enough for Silvors to win the game. It looks like he almost wants to go for that Stellina again. Maybe right. try to get that Mazaki out. But you know, as we can see... what. It's probably the last card in the deck at this point. We have not seen this Mizaki at all, even with all of these glide True. shenanigans. We'll just have a little peek. <laughs> yeah, we can't see the discovers, but we can imagine what the kind of cards are that he's probably seeing there. Uh, shovels back in the AI. And uh, again, he's just praying if he didn't see the cram session and that there is no cram session in hand to be able to keep the draw up. You're doing business. Ooh. A Megtheradon does not seem like it's going to be doing anything this game. Here's the spell damage. That is just going to be lethal because... Oh, oh it has the... Oh. oh, my gosh. Wow. That's pretty sick. I didn't even <laughs> consider that. You discover a card off of Primordial, shuffle it, draw it back, and it gets the uh, the buff yeah. from Aegwyn. That's cool. That was only possible because of that glide, but right. it actually paid off really well. Like he said, no Mazaki needed. We've seen uh, a game earlier, Garot, who needs it? You just fill the board with minions. We've seen Mizaki Mage, and ah, who needs it? You just burst them down with others. So, <laughs> you know, the whole deck is named after it, but you don't need it. It's fine. Very cool pan out. One that we can't necessarily analyze, especially well because of not being able to see any of the discover options but just in terms of a spectacle that was awesome very very cool from uh mega Gliscor to go for as you said uh, a backup game plan here uh in terms of just not even relying on the mazaki uh, i wonder if his game plan would have changed if he'd seen a better start from silvors because then maybe he would have had to go a little bit more risky and rely on just finding that mazaki a little bit sooner uh, but he capitalized on that weak start from mega gliscor fantastically well in my opinion being able to uh just push burn face turns out that's good enough and it means that uh mega 